In this video, we're going to demonstrate how to work with some common GIS data formats, especially <coughs> ESRI data formats, the, the coverage, the shapefile, and the geodatabase. Here you can see we're looking at standalone art catalogs <coughs> at our spatial data formats folder here. And we've got two shapefiles, a coverage, two file geodatabases, and a personal geodatabase. Art Catalog is our file management tool for our spatial data from Esri. It works really well with all of these GIS data formats, or geodata, or geographic data. If you look at these different uh, GIS data formats in Windows Explorer, you'll notice Windows Explorer doesn't understand them as well. A shapefile is made up of at least three files. <coughs> In this case, there are several more, but the DBF, the SHT, and the SHX are required files for a shapefile, and you'll see how those are created when we create a shapefile. If you define the projection, you get a PRJ file. If you create some, or, or as indexes are built, spatial and tabular indexes, some of these other files are built, the metadata is stored in the XML files. So GIS data, are usually com comprised of, of many different files and, and the operating system management tool, File Explorer here, just doesn't do a very good job of, of handling these files. So, so we use our catalog to manage these files. <coughs> the geodatabase, the file-based geodatabase is a folder with a bunch of different files in it. Because it's a folder, you could save something like a map document into that folder. You never want to do that. Only let the files in here be files that are managed by the GIS software. So we'll come back to some of these as, as we move through this demo. <coughs> okay, so um, a big thing to understand is, is the difference between uh, system fields and user-defined fields when we build and work with GIS data. <coughs> the oldest GIS data format, the coverage here, you can see it's comprised of some different feature classes. And it's difficult to even create coverages anymore, but it's important to understand the, the system fields that were defined in a coverage because a lot of coverage data was converted to shapefiles and to geodatabases. And a lot of those fields were retained. They're not necessarily used or updated, and it's important to know where they come from. We oftentimes see fields that we, we don't understand what kind of information they hold, and sometimes you can figure out what they are, and sometimes you can't, but this will allow you to know at least how some of them were created. So, <coughs> anytime a coverage was created, the attribute table <coughs> that we can preview here in our catalog, we can preview the geometry, this polygon feature class is made up of these polygons, and you can also look at the the tabular information. So, if you remember from uh, uh, the the lecture that I did this week, geo or coverages, the polygons had to be created from lines. So the lines were created first. Lines have an ID, a from node, and a to node, and a polygon that's to the left and to the right. These are system defined fields. That art could have some other user-defined fields, like maybe the type of fence between two areas, or the type of road, if it was a, if the, the arc represented a line was a, a road, or a stream name. These arcs were just used to create these polygons. And when you create polygons, you get some other system-defined fields. In the coverage, every polygon feature class has an area and a perimeter field. And when you would issue the commands of build or clean, it would update these fields. They didn't update in real time, but as you edited data, when you finished editing, you would issue some commands on the coverage that would update these fields. You also <coughs> had two ID fields, the bunk LULC field pound and the bunk LULC field dash ID. So you you had two fields 
that were defined, their names were the coverage name, bunk, L-U-L-C, pound, and the coverage name, dash ID. So for every coverage you had, there's a couple of fields that were named based on the coverage name with a pound and an ID. If you look further, you'll see some user-defined fields, a land use code and a description of that code. <coughs> so coverages have these system fields here and then these user fields. So if we were to convert this land use layer to a shape file, which we will do, some of these fields would be retained. Now, something to, to mention, these numbers look really small. So that's, that's kind of weird, that's a really small area. Well, if you look at the geography here and look down here in the bottom right, you'll see this data is in decimal degrees. This data is stored in latitude and longitude. It's pretty obvious to me because Buncombe County looks squished, it looks smushed. Projections to store your data from, <coughs> and geographic data typically looks a little smushed like that. So the units are based on coordinate system units. So area and perimeter are in, area is in square degrees and perimeters in, in degrees. And a degree is not like a foot or a meter or an inch. As far as a unit of measure goes, a degree changes its ground distance as you move around the globe. If you took intro to GIS here, we talked about this some. Um, a degree is it of, uh, l of longitude as it moves towards the poles, lines of latitude of longitude come together. So uh, a degree is a smaller ground distance at the poles than it is at the equator. And it's, it's not a very good unit of measure to use if you are measuring things. It's a good unit of measure for determining one position on Earth, or a good system for that. So, system fields. So, what happens if I want to convert this feature class to a shapefile? I can right-click it and I can export it to a shapefile. <coughs> now, coverages, like I said, were the dominant data format for almost 20 years and they were very powerful and they did things that no other data format did for a long time. Things have advanced now and, and the cover or the geo database is a is a better way of doing things, but you might still find a coverage somewhere. So coverages cannot be edited in ArcGIS. So one of the first things we usually do is we export the features from the coverage to either a shapefile or our geo database so we can do some other things. For now, I'm gonna export this to a shapefile because I wanna edit the data and I can edit a shapefile. And I wanna just show you what happens here. So I'm gonna convert a data format here. The uh, output location, I'm gonna make that same folder. And the new feature class, it's actually gonna be a shapefile that gets created. We mentioned that shapefiles are often referred to as a feature class because they store just one group of features that are similar to each other in nature and have the same attributes and geometry. So I'm going to call this land use. Let's call it land use. Now, <coughs> these are the fields that are in the coverage. And this is what happens. People are afraid to delete fields because they think that maybe they'll be needed sometime again. In reality, these two fields, the bunk LULC underscore and the bunk LULC one, those are the IDs. This one had a pound on it, and this one had a dash ID on it. So the different data formats, the tab, the tables that that work with the different data formats, each database and database table supports different field naming conventions. So the coverage which stored this information in an info table, the coverage data, or the info database that was used to store this information supported having a pound and a dash in the field name. The shape file stores its attributes in a DBF table, and DBF files do not support the pound and the dash ID, so it substitutes some characters in here. I could delete those fields and tell it not to transfer those fields during the conversion process. That really should be done 
but it's rarely done because people don't understand well enough what these fields do. They're afraid to delete them. In reality, these two ID fields will never be used again when they're converted. So you can't always drop them, but we're not going to at this time. So I'm going to click OK, and we'll see what happens here. You can see the feature class conversion is, is, is cranking through here. Hopefully it won't take too long. So now I have a new land use shape file. Notice it looks the same. And if I look at the table, it's got those same fields. It updated these two to take out the pound and the dash ID because it didn't like those. It, it has to do with it doesn't support a pound or a dash and it only supports a certain number of characters, so it truncated some too. But it did keep these ones. Now, the confusion comes because people see an area field in a shape file and they think that area field is, is correct. Area fields are often in a shape file because it was a coverage at one time and that field's left over from the coverage. The field is not updated anymore and that's an important concept to understand and we'll come back to that. Another thing I want to show you real quick, now I've got this land use shape file in the spatial data format folder. And if I look at Windows Explorer, this is what actually got created when that land use shape file was created by converting the shape file, the, the coverage feature class. Notice the date, 119 at 1035. We can see the time here. Okay. All right. So let's just keep moving. How about if I create a shapefile from scratch? What if I right click and make a new shapefile? I'm in our catalog, I can make a new shapefile. What kind of fields does it give? I'm gonna call this, let's call it campus trees. Notice there's a default type of points. Make sure and pick the right geometry type. When you create a feature class in a geodatabase, the default is po polygon, I believe, and it's point here. So make sure you pick the right thing here. And if I go to edit this, let's just say I want it to be in state plane feed. Just say I'm going to digitize these trees on top of from an aerial photograph. And I know the aerial photograph is in state plane, so this is going to be in state plane. When I click OK, it defines a coordinate system and click OK again. What do you know? I've got a campus trees shape file. The campus trees shape file created all of these files, okay? The DBF, the PRJ, and the SHP are required. And it looks like the PRJ file is now a CPG. That's a little different than, than it used to. Maybe this version of the software has um, modified how it does uh, the projection information. The important thing is understanding these different files make up your shape, shape file not just that one .shp. They all make up your shape file. You need them all. So if we go look at the attribute table for that campus trees, there's no points, it's empty. You look at the table, and these are the fields. You get an FID, a feature ID, a shape, and an ID field. These are the only system fields in a shape file. You can add other fields by coming in here to the properties of the shape file. I double clicked it, you can right click it and go to properties. It does have a coordinate system and the fields tab. What if I wanted to store the name of the tree or the type as a text field that holds 50 characters and maybe I wanted to store the height and we'll make that a, a number field. Short and long store whole numbers. We want to store a float or a double. Both of those allow us to store decimal places. The difference in short and long is how many significant characters you can carry or you can store. You can store over 32,000 and something. It's a short integer. If it's a bigger number than that, you need a long integer. That's the same in the difference between the float and the double is the amount of significant digits you can carry uh, or store. We just need a float for this. So let's just click OK. Now I've got some some user defined fields too. So as I put in points, these first three fields will be updated automatically and these two fields will be updated by, by me. Let's create one more shape file and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it rows just so we can demonstrate something with it. 
road. We're going to make it a line shape file and update the coordinate system. And I'm not going to give it any other. So now we've got one more shape file. And you can see road down here created. Now there's that PRJ file. I, I don't know what happened to the PRJ file for campus trees, but it should have been created as well. The PRJ file stores the projection information. All right. So, moving right along. <coughs> so, let's look at the land use layer here, and uh, um, let's let's look at a different layer. All right. So, here is the Greenville or the AB the the Asheville Emergency Management Zone. So what fields are there in a geodatabase? What system fields versus what user-defined fields? So just like the coverage stored area per and perimeter, it stored them in a field called area and a field called perimeter. The geodatabase has an object ID field instead of an FID. It also has a shape field. Then all of these are user-defined fields until you get to the end and you see the other system fields. So polygon feature classes in geodatabases keep up with area and perimeter too. Since the coverage data format used the field names area and perimeter, they called these field names a little bit different. Perimeter is, is stored in the shape length field and area is stored in the shape area field. So this is a good example of a polygon feature class that has these fields in it that are automatically updated in real time by the system when polygons change. So I'm going to convert this to a shapefile too so I can demonstrate something. So let's export to a shapefile. I'm going to put it in that folder. I'm going to call it EMS. And notice, and I should, I should show that again, <coughs> when I did that, when I exported EMS, I had the option to delete some fields. So I could tell it to get rid of any of these fields I want. The important thing to understand is that once it goes to a shape file, the shape length and the shape area field are not updated anymore. So let's go into ArcMap and let's look at this and, and see it happen. So in ArcMap, I'm going to load in the uh, EMS and the or the EMS shape file there and I'm going to load in from this other one these pucks are, are watershed boundaries <coughs> hydrologic units I believe is what it stands for okay now in arc map if we look at our our source here <coughs> Notice that I've got this layer loaded out of the spatial data formats folder. And since it shows you a folder right there, it tells you this is a shape file in a folder. Since this shows you the geodatabase icon there, this tells you it's a feature class in a geodatabase. So I'm going to start editing. And something you need to know about editing if you don't already, when you start editing, you can only edit within one geodatabase at a time or one folder at a time, it won't let you edit shape files and geodatabase feature classes at the same time, even if they're in the same folder. So the first example I'm going to give you here is of the, the feature class in the file geodatabase, the HUC. And I'm going to, it gives me a little spatial reference warning. You, typically, you don't want to edit data that has projected on the fly, but we're going we're gonna to let it ride this time. I'm going to turn this off. And remember, this is a shape file. And if I look at the table for this shape file in the polygon, <clears throat> this shape file has a shape length and a shape area field. Notice shape length got truncated because when it got converted from the geodatabase feature class to the shape file, the DBF format doesn't support more than two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten characters. So it truncated the TH off the end of that. More importantly, what happens 
if you select a polygon, let's select one that is higher up. All right, there we go. Look at that polygon. Okay, so this polygon <coughs> has an area of three, six, what is that? Three, six hundred thousand, three, thirty three million, I believe. Square what? It's square feet if you look down here in the bottom right. This data is in state plane feet, so this is in square feet. So when it's a shape file format, if I go and I split this polygon in half, I'm going to use this cut polygon tool on my editor toolbar. And I'm not editing the right thing. I should be editing the hut. That's what I said I was going to edit. Okay, so I'm not editing the shape file. I'm editing this file, the geodatabase feature class, and it has the shape area and shape length fields. And remember, in the geodatabase feature class, these fields should automatically update. So if I cut that in half, I end up with two polygons, and you'll see that the value changes. So let me do that again to demonstrate again. If I select that polygon, and I'm only looking at the selected record, 129,372 is the shape area. So I'm going to cut that polygon in half or so and cut it in whatever you want. And notice this 129, you're going to see two polygons when I'm done, and those two numbers equal the 129. So it updates in real time. <clears throat> I'm going to stop editing. I'm not going to save my edit. And let's do that to the, this shape file. So I'm going to start editing again. And this time I'm going to edit the, the shape file, the EMS layer. And this is what I want you to, to understand. This shape file, if we look at the table for it, oops, wrong key, wrong key. All right. There is a shape area field because it was a geodatabase feature class and we converted it to a shape file. So what happens when you split a polygon to the attributes? You'll see in the geodatabase we can have finer control over what happens to attributes when they split. But with a shape file, what happens is it essentially duplicates the attributes. So the station for the two new polygons is going to be E8. The geoproximity is going to be E8D. That's going to be E8D. And since these fields are no longer managed by the system because they're not a geodatabase feature class, they're a shape file, they're going to be duplicated too. So notice the area is 175540. When I double click, when we look at the two, notice these numbers are the same. It just duplicated the information. That is why area and perimeter, shape area, shape length fields in, in shape files are, uh, are, can be confusing and misleading. If you ever see a shape area or an area field or a shape file, what you want to do is calculate it. And you can manually update that field by right clicking it and calculating geometry. So the shape file will do this based on functionality in the software a tool that runs on the data format. So the data format in and of itself isn't powerful enough to, to handle this kind of thing. The software has to implement some code on the, the, uh, the format. So let's calculate geometry. We want to calculate the area using the coordinate system and, and square feet, because we know that square feet, and click OK. And notice that it, it updated those two numbers. Now, shape, area, and length, in a coverage used to update in a geodatabase, shape length and shape area. If it's a polygon, shape length is perimeter, and shape area is area. If it's a polyline feature class, you'll see a shape length field, and that is the actual length of a line. So, <coughs> what about a field like an area field? You can add fields like acres, okay? so. This area field 
it's awesome that the system maintains and keeps up with it. But a lot of times, we want a field that stores something like acres because it makes a little bit more sense to us. So I can add a field to this table. Maybe. No, I can't. I need to stop editing. Then I can add a field. I'm not going to save my edit. You can't change the schema of the database during an edit session. I'm going to call it acres. And I'm going to make it a float because that will store decimal places and, and plenty of it. The scale is how many decimal places to the right. The precision is the total number of characters. I don't, I don't know how many I need. All right, there's acres. Now I can populate this as well using calculate geometry. I'm going to calculate the area, but I'm going to calculate it in acres. So you can calculate acres, but the system doesn't do it for you. Acres is something that you have to do using the Calculate Geometry, no matter whether you're in a geodatabase feature class or a shape file. So I want to reemphasize that these days the coverage is not really used very much at all. You may see data in a coverage format and you'll immediately convert it to a shape file or a geodatabase feature class. And you'll often what you'll often more time see is shape files and geodatabase feature classes that, that have fields left over from when it was a coverage. So you want to know that those fields aren't updated necessarily, so you can update them with calculate um, geometry. All right. Um, I think I've covered most of what I need to uh, before you do your little demo. Um, just make sure you understand that the fields that are system fields for the geodatabase feature class are shape length, shape area, object ID, and shape. For a coverage, you had fields like R poly and left poly and from node and to node as well as area, perimeter, and the, the coverage name pound and coverage name dash ID. And the arc, the left node, fill node. And the geodatabase feature classes have an object ID, a shape, and the shape, the shape files only had three system defined fields. The shape files do not keep up with topology. When we say topology or the spatial relationship of features, what we're really talking about is the, the shape and area field and how it manages the connectivity between things. Okay, if you have any questions during the exercise, please let me know. Thanks for listening.